In this episode of the AWS Developers Podcast, we are talking about database performance. Good morning. Thank you for joining the AWS Developers Podcast. You know, every Friday we are in your podcast application, Apple, Deezer, Spotify. Uh, we are even on YouTube right now. We the video, just the sound, but you can uh, listen to us on YouTube as well. Please subscribe and uh, share your feedback, leave comments, uh, little thumbs up or uh, stars uh, to, to, to let us know. Also, what are the subjects you want us to address in future episodes of this podcast? Today, as I mentioned in the introduction, we are talking talking about uh, database performance and I.O. and disk provisioning. It matters as well for developer, and we are going to explain why. I have the pleasure to host uh, Scott, uh, Scott Lynn, your principal product manager for RDS. RDS, I think we don't have to define its relational data base services to manage database from AWS? So RDS is, is the relational database services, right? So it, it's a managed it's a managed database service. So we we manage the databases for you, right? We deal with things like backups, uh, restore, configuration options, right? We, we handle it for you. So customers don't have to install an operating system to install. I remember when I was younger installing uh, Oracle database out of a floppy disk at the time. Yes. Oh, sorry. wow. Yeah. That, that, that old. <laughs> and having to patch the operating system, patch the database engine. It's yeah. just a few clicks in the console and API and I have a database. And it's not only Oracle, of course, we do support multiple um, database engine. Do you know the, the list? Uh, <laughs> out of your head. The engines we support are, are MySQL, MariaDB, uh, Postgres, uh, Oracle, uh, uh, SQL Server, and now uh, DB2, IBM DB2. As a product manager, you're working a lot with our customer. When you talk with, with customer, what are the main um, criteria? What are the main cause of, um, that are impacting the performance of their databases? So uh, there's a few things actually, and, and some of them some of them aren't as well known even. So the, the uh, while the inst instance size is, is is critical, right, to your workload, the bigger the workload, the bigger instance you, you generally need, so right? More CPU, more memory. More CPU and memory, right? Mm -hmm. the, it's yeah, simple enough, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, one of the things about that is is that the the CPUs and memory, the CPU, the instances, various instance sizes will have limits on the storage. The storage performance, like certain the certain amount of throughput or IOPS that they're able to achieve, right? And um, while it may have enough memory, if you're really, really disk dependent, like you're doing a massive number of writes per second, for example, uh, you may need more throughput and more IOPS available on the instance. So that's that's something that uh, encourage people to look at if you if you're having if you're having performance issues, that's another thing is not not only the disk and the IOPS there, but also look at the instance to make sure that it can actually drive. You have a big enough instance to be able to drive drive the performance you, you need. So it really depends on the workload and the type of queries, the type it's, of usage. We do not necessarily link to the, the database engine. So I, right. I mean, it's more on the application side <laughs> uh, yes. than on the database engine side. Yes, yes, yes. Right. So, uh, an OLTP workload, for example, is is going to need is going to have different set of requirements than a BI workload, right? One question that I like to ask to mm -hmm. candidates when I, I do technical interview mm -hmm. is explain me the different ways, um, the different solution you might have to scale a relational database, and that triggers tons of different discussion. Um, so, if you have to summarize, what what are the possible ways to to scale a relational database? The way I talk about it is scale up or scale out, right? So you either you either increase your instance size, your memory, your your CPU, the, the volumes, right? And you, you know, the traditional method of uh, of of building a database, right? Which is build it bigger and bigger and bigger, more monolithic. And then the other way is scale out, spread the workload across multiple instances. You know, uh, sharding is a common way. Partitioning, right? You you can actually partition. Um, this was actually a question I got when I was interviewing at one of our competitors years and years and years ago. Uh, you know, one of the ones you're not allowed to name in in a lot of cases, right? And uh, was you know how do you deal with how do you deal with you have a you know, worldwide system and um, a world like a worldwide database, mm -hmm. and how do you deal with you run out of the 
run out of CPU and memory. Like you, you the, it's as big as it's going to get now, right? It's the as big as an entire server, right? What do you do? Or, and the you know the answer is you know you well okay you regionalize, right? So you move it, you move the parts of. If someone's in Europe, then you move them to a European database, right? Or you can do it that way too, right? So, and then you can do that based not just on location, but other things, right? Like um, one one client, uh, I uh, one customer I had years ago, did it based on your 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 user ID, right? As mm -hmm. you logged in, you you got sent to a particular set of servers based on your user ID, right? So being able to, to distribute the workload that way. Like there's lots of ways to do it, but the point is to to move the data away so that, you know, fewer not, people are using the same the instance. Yeah. Is, is hitting the same database, but yeah. that requires additional complexity on the application side because you need some kind of algorithm, uh, hashing a me mechanism on the user ID, for example, and some logic to decide where to put what type of data and where to look for data when you're searching for the data. Yeah, there are also ways you can do it on, on, on the database side, right? With like mm -hmm. things like proxy and things like that, right? So, mm -hmm. um, I mean, proxy doesn't, anyway. You can do it with things like that, right? Mm -hmm. Like you can uh, uh, you can move the once the once the user connects, you can move you can redirect, right, and respond back with, oh no, you actually want to go over there, right? And in between the two, so you you said the first solution is to uh, scale up, add more memory, CPU, yeah. throw more disk at the at the game. Um, on the other side, we were talking about sharding, which is a complex schema of splitting the data into uh, multiple databases in mm -hmm. between there is just adding more read replica depending on the workload you're, you're going to tell me i know okay. but if, if it is like a 80 20 80 percent of read 20 percent of writes having more read replica it's a good intermediate solution yes. in terms of management and ease of, of deployment yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, it depends on your your workload, right? Mm -hmm. But it, it, you know, but a, a lot of workloads are are, are followed that that same kind of uh, eighty twenty rule, right? Like most of your work is going to be reads, right? And then some of it's only some of it's writes. Like you have a you know like a, a e commerce app or something, right? The you know the the cart it's mostly read. Mm -hmm. It's mostly read, right? And the cart is the write. So you know. Yeah. yeah, you can split your workload to have like the shopping cart in in, a, in one instance of the database right. and the, the catalog, the shopping catalog in in a, a, a fleet of exactly only, uh, instances. Um, so one one of the key um, metric to measure when we are uh, concerned about data perf uh, database performance is is the the I/O and the throughput. Mm -hmm. um, maybe can we redefine I/O and throughput just to to have everybody on on the same baseline in terms of vocabulary? IOPS are, you know, the amount the amount of I.O. you can push per second, right? Now, one of the things about that is it's a count of I.O.s. It has nothing to do with the size of those I.O.s. So it depends right? on the block size. It depends, right. Mm -hmm. Throughput depends on the block size, right? And actually bandwidth, the when we talk about I.O.ps, when we talk about like allocated I.O.ps or provisioned I.O.ps, that's actually the bandwidth, right? How much How much data can I push through this pipe? Right. So, uh, and then these three, th these three things are, you know, related to each other. Uh, right. So the bigger the IOs, the, the, uh, you may get fewer IOPS. To achieve the same throughput. To achieve, you get, well, you do have fewer IOPS and you mm -hmm. achieve the same throughput. Or if you, if you run a certain, a certain amount of IOPS, like a thousand IOPS, right. And your IO size goes from say 16K to a megabyte, your throughput goes through the roof. Right, so uh, they're they're related and they're they're different. And the good news with RDS is that customer can change that or can can control this parameter um, easier than on premises because when you have a, a, a RDS instance, you can choose the type of storage that will be allocated. Yes. Uh, to 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 your database engine. So, what are the different types of of storage on RDS? So, there are three different types of storage. So, the first one is provision, what we call provisioned IOPS storage, and that's where you can actually provision the IO the IOPS, right? You can pre-allocate. I want to have this this workload needs this many IOPS, right? And it's fast, predictable, and consistent IO performance, right? And it, within provisioned IOPS, we have a we have two 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 versions, IO one that we released back in 2012. Um, and it was our first our first version of uh, provisioned IOPS storage, um, and uh, it, you can think of it like 
provisioned IOPS v1, right, version one. And then we have IO2, which we just announced back in March, support for back in March. And it gives you the highest performance, the most consistent latency control, and it's at the same price as IO1. And you could think of it like provisioned IOP storage version, version two, two. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, when- and, so I like to talk about it like that. Like IO2 is our next generation storage, uh, IOP, provisioned IOP storage, and IO1 is our previous generation. When we talk about provision something on AWS, usually it means that we reserve capacity, AWS right. reserve capacity. So it means there is a cost associated to that, even when customer is not using it because the capacity is provision. Right. Is it the same with uh, provision IOPS for, for RDS? Yes, it is. So when you, uh, you know, it, with an RDS instance, uh, you pay for storage if the instance is, is uh, shut. You still pay for storage if the instance is shut down. Makes sense. We need to right? keep the data. We need we to keep the data around. <laughs> right. <laughs> <Do> that, <laughs> right, exactly. So I, I recently got that question. I was like, well, okay. Um, but yeah, so uh, with provisioned IOPS, you, you can provision the amount of the amount of IOPS that you want to have for the, your workload, for your volume. And uh, yes, you, you pay for that, right? Um, the great thing about IO2 is... It, you get this higher performance. In fact, it's the highest performance um, uh, st- uh, cloud-based storage world in the world. Like it's <laughs> right. And so, n- customers choose the number of IOPS they want or they yes. need for the application. Yes. And we we reserve that capacity for them, and they yes. can change at any time. So, uh, if, I don't know if they have like a peak of activity at some some right. at the end of the month, they can change that ahead of time and then reduce to pay less uh, for regular workloads. Yeah, and actually, it's surprisingly more customers don't do that. Like I would highly recommend that. Right. So if you if you have a predictable uh, load workload and it peaks. And you know when it's going to peak, you can uh, scale up easily in, in very very short amount of time. It happens pretty much instantly. The 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 amount of IOPS you wanna you wanna provision. Um, the uh, to now once you make that change, you have to have keep you can't make any other changes to the volume for at least six hours. Yeah, the okay. time I guess for us to to right. to to stabilize uh, right. the, the the system. But changing is as simple as an API call. There is no yep. need to restart the database or to interrupt the, the the service. It's transparent. Exactly, and the same is true with with scaling the the storage up. Right, you can do that just with a so simple adding API capacity. Call. Adding capacity, and then also true in converting from IO one to IO two. It's an online operation. And it's a single modify API call also. So provision IOPS is um, the first type of, right. of storage. What, what's the typical workload um, that is that that is well suited with with provision IOPS? What type of database? What type of application customers so, are, are deploying on provision IOPS? Um, so uh, the the ones that are very that are um, latency sensitive are the are the biggest ones, right? So um, you know I have a customer that their uh, their login. The database that manages user user IDs and logins and, and, and you know, permissions, like in like a customer goes to a website to log in, right, gets pounded by these requests, and so they they're running um, IO2 on that for that very particular reason, right? Like they can do, you know, millions of of requests, right. That, that's a system that is often overlooked by by enterprise. Yes. They think about scaling the main core business application, but right. they didn't realize that they need also to scale the, the login part because if there is a, a large number of right. customers joining at a specific moment of time, the login has to, to, to follow as well. I was talking with a broadcaster in France um, that uh, created an infrastructure to broadcast the, the soccer World Cup, the football World, World Cup, the European football uh, World Cup. Oh, I should not say European. It's worldwide, except U.S. football <laughs> World Cup, and and they said they spend more time um, preparing and scaling the logging system yeah. than actually the, the infrastructure to stream the, the the video feeds and the players. So logging, yeah, it's a very good example of, of this type of application. So yeah. anything which is sensitive to latency, where you need a quick response time. Exactly right. <laughs> right, heavy workloads also where you need a quick resp- response back, right, and or you have a large number of writes happening all at once, right. Um, these these kinds of things, and you know, uh, that's where you want to use provisioned IOPS. So provisioned IOPS is one of them. Uh, the second one is uh, GP, general purpose. General purpose. So what yeah. Is it? So general purpose is our SSD back storage, right? And so there's there's two types there. There's GP two, which is the uh, the 
well, it's it's the older uh, older general purpose SSD storage, right? Um, and there's not re- there's n- there's not a lot to configure with it. It's it's really pretty simple to use. It's uh, you get three IOPS per gigabyte of storage allocated with a minimum of a hundred gigs or a hundred IOPS allocated to it, um, and that that's limited to on RDS. That's uh, because we actually do striping. It's limited to, to 64,000 IOPS uh, for the four volumes that we stripe across. Um, by the way, uh, we should talk about that a little more when I finish this description about the striping and, and when it happens and things like that. Um, and then we have GP3, which is our, our, our latest generation general purpose storage. And that allows you to um, actually provision IOPS or prov- and provision throughput. Um, for an additional cost, you get a fixed amount of throughput. It's um, 125 megabytes per second when it's a single volume, and um, uh, four times that, or you know, 500 megabytes a second uh, uh, when it's a four-way stripe. And it's it, we include in the pricing uh, 3,000 IOPS for a, a single volume and 12,000 IOPS for a striped volume. So you said something, oh, you said multiple things that are interesting. Let me yeah. go back. Yeah, to yeah, one. It was, yeah. Well, well, one of them is that uh, you receive more IOPS if your volume is larger. So it means mm-hmm. um, the two metrics or the two characteristics are, uh, are linked, IO and uh, volume uh, mm-hmm. and the size of the volume. So sometimes I need more IO, but I don't need to pay for extra space. That's why we have provision IOPS, if it yes. is the, yes. the, the use case. So in provision yes. IOPS, we can separate the provisioning of the um, storage, so the right. size of the volume and the I/O, which is tied to uh, that, the performance. And that's great. Yes, that's one of the key distinctions between the two types of volumes, right? Um, so uh, we recommend GP3 for your your you know your dev test workloads for some some you know there are plenty of production workloads that don't need don't really aren't latency sensitive. You know if you're running um, uh, you know like a, a a blog site, right? Mm-hmm. You're not particularly latency sensitive to how long it takes the blog to load. Also, right? businesses, a small uh, business, small yeah, businesses, yeah, right. Mm-hmm. But if you have a if you have a if you have a I/O intensive workload that's latency sensitive, and um, then provisioned IOPS storage is the way to go. Is the way to go, okay, right. And something else that you mentioned uh, when describing general purpose, you talk about striping. So can you elaborate a bit on that? What, yeah. what is striping and what are we doing with, with striping in RDS? Yeah, so l- thanks for looping back around on that for me. <laughs> so um, so RDS, the way we can vision, provision uh, our, our storage volumes, um, this applies to, so um, it gets a little complicated here, but for the open source <laughs> engines and, uh, and for uh, DB2, um, uh, uh, we provision uh, up to four up to four hundred gigs. It's a single volume. Mm-hmm. Above four hundred gigs or four hundred gigs and above, actually, um, we provision a four way RAID RAID zero or striped volume. So we take four volumes underneath and we present it as one volume striped. So it really gives you uh, uh, up to four x the the performance. Of, of the single volume, right? So st- strapping means that like if we have, I, I take numbers out of the blue like that, but if I have yeah. a one megabyte block to write, uh, it will be split in four, four ways. 256 kilobyte. And yes. these four blocks will be written in parallel on four different volumes. Exactly. Uh, ma- making the, the IO for or the, the throughput uh, four times faster. Am yes. I correct? Yes. And that's again, that's totally transparent for customer. There is they, they have no control about that on, on that. They right. cannot change that. It's just the way we implement the storage for 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 RDS. Right, right. And then for Oracle, it's two hundred megabytes is the is the threshold before we strike. Provision IOPS, general purpose, and there is a third category the third um, because category. I have the, the documentation on the <laughs> on my screen there. <laughs> it's a magnetic. Magnetic means it's an old spinning drive. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, it, it, um, for years now, I've called it spinning rust, right? Because <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's 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 a iron iron oxide, right? Um, uh, but yeah, it's spinning drives. Uh, now we don't recommend these anymore. Um, uh, you know, but it is it is a, a cheap and slower way to access. To, you know, if you so if you have a workload that um, doesn't have any real IO requirement, IOPS requirements, mm-hmm. right? Uh, 
can be slow. You want it to be extremely cheap, right? Uh, magnetic is will save you a little bit of money actually, but not not a whole lot really over uh, GP two or GP three. Uh, uh, so we rec- we don't recommend it anymore. So it's more like an historical. Uh, yeah, it's more like yeah backward compatibility mm-hmm. support for now, right? For right. customer that still use it, but you yeah, won't yeah, recommend to start a new database instance today with magnetic. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. If you're spinning up a, a, a new instance today, don't spin it up magnetic. Just don't do it. It's not okay. worth it. So, it's, yeah, it's there. For, it's for, there. It's for there. Compatibility. So yeah. when you were talking about IO uh, IOPS two, IO two, which mm-hmm. is, which is the second generation of of um, uh, IOPS provision uh, okay. volume, uh-huh. um, you mentioned a couple of benefits. Can we get back to that? So, yeah. what what was the challenge we were trying to solve with IO one? So IO one allowed you. Uh, we built a high performance. Right, uh, um, latent, latency, uh, low latency volume, cloud volume, right? And uh, it was launched 12 years ago, right? It allowed you up to 256,000 IOPS to be allocated on RDS, um, uh, 64 terabytes of storage and up to four gigs, uh, gigabytes a second of throughput. Um, and it gave you single digit uh, millisecond latency through what we call P99.9 or 99.9% mm-hmm. of the That's time, something. right? Um, uh, and it allowed a 50 to 1 IOPS to gigabyte ratio, mm-hmm. maximum ratio, okay? Um, and, and that was the original design. And, you know, it was designed for high-performance workloads. Now, like everything in computing... 12 years ago, the high-performance workload is not the same. Not the same as today. As today. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we we, you know... Just like any technology, we went back and we created the new version of it, right? And IO2 or IO2 Block Express it's a, is actually what it should be called, okay? Um, is our current generation. We launched it, RDS support for it in March of 2024. It also allows two, 256,000 IOPS and 64 terabytes of storage. Um, however, you can get up to, now this is like a, in the extreme corner cases, you can get up to 16 gigabytes a second of throughput. You have to be pushing yeah. a large a large amount of data, and you have to have an instance that can handle it. And, and like, there's so many caveats. So when you look at our documentation, we 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 don't say that. We say four four gigs because it's like, but if you really push, you like it's possible. We've seen some Oracle workloads right push like up almost eight gigs a second, right? Wow. Yeah. Uh, so it, it it's it's possible. Um, you get sub millisecond latency through uh, P ninety nine point nine or ninety nine percent ninety nine point nine percent of the time, and we actually see it far beyond that. Like it doesn't breach one millisecond until far be- beyond ninety nine point nine percent, but that's what we promise is ninety nine point nine percent. And you get the best latency outlier control in the in the industry for in the in any cloud, right? So. What does that mean? What is latency outlier control? That's like a highly technical term, right? And like, okay, but it means that uh, the like compliance to sub millisecond latency, right, or, or is better than the any other volume, any other volume type. So, like I said, it goes tends to go far beyond ninety nine point nine percent, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then even then. Its, its outliers will be smaller. The latency times will be smaller than the other volume types. Okay, and it's designed for that, right? So that involves more hardware, more software monitoring it, being you know being faster to react, things like that, right? So the volume it's, itself is designed to maintain this very low latency characteristics. I have a stupid question. Maybe we'll cut that if it is really stupid. Um, <laughs> These volumes are available for RDS, or they are they available for Aurora as well? I think Aurora is using a different type of storage. So, or, or Aurora uses a different kind of storage. Okay, and it's completely a different architecture. Okay, so here we are talking about Amazon RDS and Amazon yes. RDS. and actually, uh, you, only. you should probably leave that in because lots of people have that question. <laughs> in fact, when we launched um, GP3 a couple of years ago, two and a half years ago. I was out on Reddit and somebody said, I can't get my in, my database instance to use GP3. And um, somebody replied, oh, that's because they don't support clustering on GP3, which, yeah. <laughs> yep. Right. And I was like, no, no, no. 
right? But this was like the first time I ever posted on Reddit. No, 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 that's not the case. The, the, that's an Aurora instance that you're you're trying to spin up. It uses different storage. And the person that had responded told me I was wrong. <laughs> right. And then you answer so, what? I'm the PM at the end. But I'm the PM. <laughs> right, right, right. I think I might know something about this, right? So but but people do have are confused about that. So um Aurora uses completely different storage that they architected particularly for Aurora. And then RDS uh, uses across multiple availability zones. And, uh, yeah, exactly. Right. Across multiple availability zones and for different performance characteristics, et cetera, et cetera. And then um RDS uses the Elastic Block Store or EBS storage. Just like actually, can I? Th yeah. th these volumes are, are, are specific to um, to RDS, or can I achieve the same with uh, EC2 if I want to self manage my my database? If you want to self manage your database, you can definitely use these. These volume types are all available, right? For um, EC2 as well. For EC2 as well, right? And you can you can. Um, with some effort and if, right and this is the thing is right rds removes a bunch of the management effort for you right that's that's what we do is <laughs> we we manage the database for you but if you want to self manage you can build a four way striped volume also right and configure that at the operating system level you mean attaching I, I, four ebs volume and then you, configure you, a red storage exactly at, and then you Linux put, put a virtual yeah. device on top of it yeah, that yeah, yeah, yeah you can do it you yeah, can do it yeah, you, you can, can. <laughs> right so I, I I can not see real compelling use case to to self manage a, a, a database. Do you have any? Um, it's a little cheaper. <laughs> yes, but, but not even that much. Yeah. Not that much when you. But here's the thing: is that's the, the the like the cost per month for the hardware effectively is a little bit cheaper, right? But you you pay the the. But the, then you the, have to pay an hour. See, exactly the per, the people have to exactly. then manage it right mm -hmm. yeah. so it's it, right that's the whole thing is yeah sure like on one this, this is one of the things especially with databases that um you when I, when I worked at a database company you know before I worked here mm -hmm. right one of the big things that we talked about with our customers were you know yeah you can do this but it's going to cost you more over here in the you know what do you want your people working on do you want them working on managing the database or do you want them working on the next thing right and, and you know usually the answer is well i really want them working on the next thing i don't want to have to manage the database yeah exactly and that's what rds does and, is and we that's manage the answer it for I, I receive from from the developers as well i want to focus on my application I exactly don't want to manage the database so i just create an RDS instance that I don't have to care about about the low-level details. Uh, one use case maybe for self-managed, but I don't think it's even valid now, uh, yes. was when you need to install some kind of additional um, application or software or daemon or whatever mm -hmm. at the operating system level, which we cannot do in the past with RDS, but now right. there is like RDS on yeah, self-managed EC2 instance. Um, so so, so you're talking about you're talking about custom, I think, is to, what you. Yeah, I forgot R the exact name. R RDS custom, for right? Which RDS for, custom that's for Oracle <laughs> and for yeah, for Oracle and SQL Server, you have mm -hmm. the ability to. Um, it's not really self-managed. It's still RDS will do a bunch of the management mm -hmm. for you, right? But you have access to the operating system. But you have access that, to the operating system and things like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. So um, if I try to summarize this conversation, if I want to start an RDS database, I remember as a developer, I have two choices. It's a low performance database, nope. small business, dev test type of workload. Then I go to GP3 uh, volume yep. and storage. If it's a real production database where latency is, is sensitive, then I go to IO2 uh, type of, of storage. Um, you explain how to start. It's just an option to choose in the console or in yep. CLI, in your CDK, Terraform or CloudFormation uh, script, it's just one line of code to change yep. to actually uh, f go from IO1 to IO2. Um, if you have to give like uh, a one call to action to finish uh, <laughs> this conversation, what's the call to action? The call to action is it, go try it. Go to the console, go, you know, go to, go to the, you know, your command line and issue a modify command to one of your IO1 instance, your IO1 storage based instances today and convert it to IO2 and just begin uh, getting the additional advantages of IO2, higher performance, lower latency, better latency control, right? And, oh, and the one thing we didn't talk about is it's 100x more durable for the same price. 
durable. So the, the yeah. risk to lose a block of data yes. is, is lower for the uh -huh. same price. And IO3, uh, sorry, IO2 and IO1 are yes. at the same The same price. price, yeah. Okay, so there is no reason to not do it. There's no reason to not do it. <laughs> Seriously, I not use double negation in my. No, it's okay. <laughs> do it. That's Just do it. Just, <laughs> Just do, do it. it. <laughs> <laughs> to quote Mikey. Scott, thank you, uh, Scott Lin, your uh, principal product manager for RDS. We we are talking in this episode about database performance and more especially on the storage side with the different uh, volume type. Thank you for your very clear explanation. Thank you you for having uh, listened this episode until the end. I'll see you next week in your favorite podcast application. It will be on Friday morning. But now go. Beat.